May I direct your attention, please, to the screens? Folks, hit the lights, please, and let's get the video going. Dr. David Banner, physician, scientist, searching for a way to tap into the hidden strengths that all humans have. Then an accidental overdose of gamma radiation alters his body chemistry. And now when David Banner grows angry or outraged, a startling metamorphosis occurs. is driven by rage and pursued by an investigative reporter. Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. The creature is wanted for a murder he didn't commit. David Banner is believed to be dead. And he must let the world think that he is dead until he can find a way to control the raging spirit that dwells within him. Oh, how many memories does that bring back, huh? Yeah. And I'm sure we all feel like that from time to time right now. Today, wake up and you're not just a little cranky, you're kind of hulky cranky, you know what I mean by that? It was uh, Dr. David Banner. And he found himself trapped in this world where he would metamorphosize to evolve, to transform into this ugly, green, studly humanoid called the Hulk every time he was enraged by something. Every time he felt threatened, every time he felt anything that got him, you know, his adrenaline going and his heart beating faster. Every single time what would happen was his transformation into the Incredible Hulk. And the Incredible Hulk, the creature himself, was one where all that characterized him was rage. He always worked to get even. He always worked to free himself out of some, you know, dark closet that the bad guys had locked David Banner into, and he comes out slamming the door and busting the walls down and grabbing the bad guy by the neck and, you know, throwing him across the room. And uh, finally, finally, once he calmed down, once he got his revenge, once that feeling of rage left him. He came back to be that docile Dr. David Banner. Here's the thing. No David Banners or no incredible hulks can be what a Christian relates to in his or her life. Emotion and feeling controls both. When David Banner felt threatened, angered, hurt, unfairly treated, he responded with this Hulk-like rage. And then the Hulk, of course, being who he was. Christians, we are not led by our feelings. We are not led by our emotions. We're not led by rage. We're not led by vengeance. We are led by love. We are led by the love of Jesus who reigns in our hearts. We are led to serve each other, not get even with each other. We are led to receive even the offenses of one another and respond with, not a transformation into the Hulk, but I guess a further demonstration of Christ. This is 
the character of the Christian. And this is why this morning's message is entitled, No Hulks in the Church. No Hulks in the Church. I could have put no Dr. Banners in the church and no Hulks in the church. We have a call. The Corinthian church is where we read Paul's words here, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I think if you think about it this way, Paul was writing to a church that was full of hulks, was full of these Dr. David banners, where they were allowing emotion to control their action. They were allowing the way you made me feel to make me respond to you. And they were broken up into their factions. They were treating each other in ways that the outside world was looking at. Remember that? The outside world was looking at and actually being shocked that these people were Christians. Paul said what? He said, you are called to love one another. And in chapter 13, it is all about love. We call it the love chapter, where Paul essentially defines love not by a dictionary definition. He describes love by action. In verses 4 through 7, it was a series of action words, seven listing what love is, and then eight, living, uh, uh, listing what love is not. Things you do, things you do the opposite of. And we looked at two of the do characteristics. Remember that? We said love is patient, which means love is the practice of patience. Um, that was to receive what other people give. Remember, even offenses hurts, things that make you sad or sorrowful, we are to take those, patient says, and we are not to respond in any sort of anger, but actually to receive in the love of Christ. And then the other is, was, love is kind. If we take in love, we are to give in love, and here was the other part of it, sacrificially. I am to see to your best, even if you offend me, I am to see to your best, and I'm to do it even at my own expense. That is Christ-like love, isn't it? Oh, man, yes it is. And then there were five is-nots to love. Love is not the practice of envy, which is jealousy. You don't look at another person's success another person's gifting or possessions, and say, I wish I had that. You say, good for you. Good. Use that for God's glory. Love does not boast. That means when we have the stuff, we don't say, look at me, look at me. We say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving me what I have. I want to use it for your glory. That's showing love. Love is not arrogant, Paul said. We take no credit. We make sure that we are last and God is first in all things. That is the demonstration of love. And then the last part of it was love is not rude. And the way I taught that was it's very broad in meaning. Basically, Christian, <laughs> anything that is not like Jesus is rude. That's, that's the bottom line. If you cause any sort of disunity, you're being rude. If you draw somebody to a point of confusion, you're being rude. If there's any, any kind of hurt or pain, rather than love and unity, you're being rude. So the actions are demanding. And Paul doesn't stop there. We're looking at more this morning. The list goes on. Today we look at four more is-nots, and then one is. Practice these. Practice these. And there will be no hulks in the church. Only those who are like Christ. 
That's what we want to be, church. And so let's pray, and then we'll look into Paul's text, beginning in verse 4. Lord, thank you for uh, another opportunity. Thank you for this glorious day. Uh, Lord, we pray now for your blessings as we continue on in this study of love. Lord, please make it more than just a study. Lord, we want this to define our lives. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give us um, an amazing understanding, a discerning of your word here. Lord, wisdom to understand it and then being able to put it to use. And finally, Lord, this, this empowering from heaven to actually use it, to go out there into this world or to be here in this church and to share the love of Christ. And Lord, finally, if there's anybody you've brought here this morning and they don't have a relationship with Jesus, we pray that today would be the day of their salvation. And we pray it in faith. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Now, here's the first for today. It does not insist on its own way. Some of your Bibles say it does not seek its own. Um, love is never selfish. That's the bottom line. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. So see if you <clears throat> agree with my summary of Jesus' attitude from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, huh? Not a hint of self-seeking. I would say that's pretty true. Not a hint of self-seeking. The only alternative to self-seeking, and this is going to be your first note here, is what I'm calling others-seeking. Huh? We get it based on what Paul said there. It is others-seeking. May your life and mine be characterized by becoming poor so that others can be rich. If you... I'm going to quote Buddha. Yeah, it's going to happen. Are you ready? Listen to this. Be careful. Don't get up and leave. Hold on. He says, you yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe... Deserve your love and affection. Did you hear that? Let me read it again. You yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. Now, I completely disagree with that statement. That is not what Jesus taught, nor is it what Jesus demonstrated. Huh. From his life beginning in Bethlehem, to the end of his life at the cross. Jesus was a pure example. Church, a pure example of the way others become rich at one's own expense. You understand, when Paul was telling the Corinthian church this, he was saying, don't dare draw a line that says, I won't go beyond this to make myself poor for you. Now, one of the great stories that you should use as a as a strong reference okay in your bibles is when jesus goes and meets the samaritan woman at the well do you remember that story he goes and he meets a samaritan woman at the well now jews thought ultimately low of samaritans they were second class and i think that's putting it kindly if a jew was seen socializing with a samaritan oh man he would hear about it in fact, if he touched the thing that the Samaritan touched, he would be considered unclean. Ah, oh, Jesus. A Jew, by the way. What does he do? He goes and seeks after this Samaritan. Oh, and a woman. A Samaritan woman. And he goes and he seeks after her and he engages in a discussion. 
And even as he acknowledges her sin, he also then generously provides for her richness. By telling her, you know what, the one that you have been speaking of, the Messiah that you know is going to become, I am he. For him to be able to say that to her at that moment, church, that was Jesus making himself poor. And I'll tell you why. It adds the story. It, it, it grows. It builds. It says that the disciples saw Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman. And then in the text it says they marveled. Now, marvel doesn't mean they're like, whoa, way to go, Jesus, yeah. It was, are you kidding me? Like, like shock. What? How is that? Did you just do what you did, Jesus? You talked to this Samaritan and a woman? Here's the way you see this adding to their richness. Uh, Peter and James and John and the rest of these disciples, you see their ministries after Jesus dies and goes to heaven. And you know what they do? They seek after the richness of others. Again and again, their ministry is characterized by this love that Paul says the Corinthians need to show. You are not going to be selfish. You, selfish. you are going to be in every way selfless. Every man went to whatever length it took to share the love of Christ, huh? Every guy. Every man died for his faith, save John, who suffered. And this is how love with you and me, Christian, it's supposed to show. Really, really it should be tangible in your life. And not just something you know. This is hard. This is very difficult. I can't do it. And neither can you. When we just decide, I'm going to do it. See, this is what I, I sort of penned in my notes. And I think this can be applied to every single action that Paul talks about love. This is what I call an up and out ministry. Okay? An up and out ministry. It's about you praying upwardly, dear Lord. This is, I can't do this. But by your power, would you please fill me afresh with your power? And I'm telling you what, church, God will honor your prayer. And what the Lord will then do. Remember how we were praying, what I told you about the theme for prayer? He will guide you in his will where you can use this power. It is an up and out ministry. Every act of love is an up and out ministry. If it's just like in and out, we got trouble. Always up and then always out. Dear Holy Spirit, I pray for his richness, but please first, listen to this, make me rich. Lord, I pray that you would make me rich, you know, in love and gifts, in the desire to be like my Savior, in sacrifice. How often do you and I pray those things? Let's, let's pray those things. And watch how the Lord will use you to make other people rich. Love is not self-seeking. I want to add one more angle to this. Because it's so important, especially for this all-about-me culture that we live in. Love avoids all forms of self-absorption. Okay, I'm going to read you a little take on that. Love avoids all forms of self-absorption. Here's a, a commentary. I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit, but listen. He says, some people will put themselves first by continually leveling blame or guilt towards themselves. They choose not to acknowledge or accept God's forgiving grace. Others will float in the waters of self-pity, constantly meditating 
on the ways others have abused them. Be aware. Any preoccupation with self is self-seeking and contrary to the way of love. Let us not forget that ours is the way of the cross. The Christian life is about dying daily to the flesh. Too many Christians try to coddle that which needs to be crucified. That's what just snagged me right there. That's why it's in your notes as number two. Don't coddle self-love. Crucify it. What a powerful way to pose it, huh? Don't coddle any self-love. Crucify it. Listen, believer. There are two angles. There are two paths when it comes to expressing or sharing yourself with other people. One is self-seeking, one is others seeking. When you go to somebody, you ask them how they're doing, and you see their eyes well up, and you know, your heart, you just, your heart goes out to them, huh? And you ask them how they're doing, maybe you put your arm around them, you know, what's going on? And they'll tell you about this terrible day they've had, or they'll tell you about their relationship that seems to be on eggshells. They'll tell you about some issue that's causing them such pain. But here's what the Holy Spirit lets you discern. They don't want you to offer pity. What they want you to do is offer the love of Christ and lead them towards Christ. I'm, I'm hurting. I don't know what just happened, but I don't know if I can take it. And, you know, I would say that because I would want you to come to me and say, listen, Raj, okay, okay. Yeah, there's pain, but you know what? There's joy. There's peace. How? By going to Christ. Let's go to Christ. And we pray with them. You know, you, you, we pray together. This is the way we can share the pain and the sorrow that might be holding us back. But then there's the other path, and this is the self-pity path, where you ask how they're doing, and they'll be like, oh, woe is me. I have suffered. I have felt pain. I have gone through hell and barely come back. I have, and they're not interested to see the Spirit of God relieve them of the pain. They want to draw you into the pain. These are the choices we have to make whenever somebody asks us, how are you doing? These are where, dearly beloved, we have to say to ourselves when we are asked by somebody who loves us, hey, what's going on? We have the opportunity right there to love them. Just make sure then you choose the right path. What a blessing it is when Christians can come together and do that. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Ah, oh, that is the love of Christ. I'll tell you what, we love like that. There ain't going to be any hulks in church. Let's go with number two now, okay? What is the next one Paul says? Love is not irritable. Another translation would be, love is not easily provoked. Love is not drawn to anger. <laughs> you remember what Dr. David Banner said to Mr. Mr. McGee? He says, Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. <laughs> Please, Christian, never. Let's never have to give somebody else a warning about making us angry, all right? It's a problem. Uh, paraxuno is the Greek word. And here's the thing about it. It means to burn with anger. Burn with anger. But what's so interesting, and this is cool to be able to share, the word is used in a way that's actually what we would call righteous 
I'll give you an example. This comes from Paul in Acts chapter 17. So he goes to Athens, and he's in Athens, and he's waiting, you know, for Timothy and Silas to come so that they can minister together. Do you remember what happens to him? He sees the idols. He sees the idol worship. He sees how people have turned God into something that God is not. And the Bible uses this word, paraxuno, to characterize the way Paul responds. But see, Paul doesn't burn with anger and turn into a hulk. Instead, do you remember what happens? His heart hurts. He desires to go and share the truth of God with the people of Athens. He, he well, you know his heart continued for people who didn't know the true God. It continued that way. So this paroxuno that Paul experienced is what, have you ever heard this term before? Righteous indignation. He has felt what's called righteous indignation. Sort of a fancy way of saying godly anger. There is such a thing as godly anger. Jesus, he sees what's going on in his temple. It says that he fashioned a whip and he drove the money changers out of the, out of the temple. He drove these vendors that were cheating his people who wanted to worship God. Get, you know, get out. That was a miracle. See, righteous indignation always results in God's glory. That's your standard. God's glory is the standard. If your um, speech... If your heart, if your mind are all focused on the glory of God in how you are going to respond to an issue, then this is the righteous indignation. Dearly beloved in Christ, there are no opinions about this. You want to know if you're responding correctly, the Bible is your standard. Jesus is your model. If You've got a heartbeat that's going too fast and you hope bad things. You're in sin. If you speak in a way that is condescending, you're in sin. This is just the kind of stuff. I'll tell you what, guys. I, I struggled with this because, um, you know, the cultists that come to your door. Back in the day, I got angry but the thing is i got angry to beat them to engage in a debate and tell them why their interpretation of the original language is wrong and blah 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 i go off on this theological trip but it was only to shame them it was only to beat them now that is what paul says you may not do in praise the lord what the holy spirit has done and I have, to, I have to pray for it because I can still get close, is now when they tell me that my Savior Jesus is the brother of Lucifer, or they tell me that he is on par with Michael the archangel, I have to receive that sort of um, insult as, the, as God would, the, the heart of hurt. And then I have to respond to them by saying, listen, let me tell you, let's say, my testimony. Let me tell you a little something about what the Bible says. Let me please tell you, and what they know is that I love them. I don't want to beat them. But I have a real heart for them because God has a real heart for them. Guys, that's righteous indignation. So make sure, please, you've got a standard, the Bible and Christ. If it serves to glorify the, you know, God, Christ, you're good to go, way to go. But any other way, well, hey, use Paul again. That guy was beaten nearly to death several times. Huh? He was wrongly accused. He was tossed in jail even though he was guilty of nothing. His own brothers, you know, J Jews, hated him. You know what? Never happens is he doesn't respond with irritation, paroxuno. 
It's amazing. I was, I was blown away. It was a humbling thing for sure. Man, in this day and age, we can get mad at the food server at Olive Garden who doesn't give us extra breadsticks. You know, that's the kind of heart sometimes we've got. What are we doing? Don't do it. Be on guard, my brother and my sister in Christ. Be on guard. Because to respond in any way such as that is simply to say, God, I am choosing to sin. So here's the tactic. If we can call it this, here's the tactic, and this is going to be in your notes as number three. The tactic, train ourselves that when anything approaches angry, we transform it into opportunity. Anytime you are drawn close to angry, make it a God-honoring opportunity. Jesus has his disciples around. They're doubting him. They're losing faith. They're saying things that are foolish. And what do you watch him do? He, man, he could give them one right in the kisser, you know? But instead, he turns it into, let me tell you about me. Let me teach you about the things of God. Let me tell you about me. Let me tell you about the expectations that my disciples have, uh, what expectations I have on my disciples. And they grew they became the men that they became thanks to Jesus not getting angry but turning it into opportunity. When you are offended, don't even, don't even say anything if you know that your tongue will cause division, will spread anger. Don't even speak. Wait. Pray, con confess, because you know it's a sin. I know it's a sin. Lord, please give me calm words of edification. And then speak. When you're being accused or criticized, I don't want to be. Imitate Jesus in your gestures. Guys, people read us. They hear us. They measure us. And every one of those things Jesus said it's going to happen, and I expect you to respond the right way. Be careful even of your gestures. Be careful of your tone of voice. Be careful of how you respond to those folks. Let them see something amazing. You just going, hmm. Hmm. And then responding in words that, well, James says in one, uh, uh, James 1, 17 and 18, but the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. You speak pure words. It is also, what is the next part? Peace loving. I shall see, I mean, you shall see me strive towards peace, says James. Willing to yield to others. Oh, this is tough stuff. I told you it's got to be up and out. If it's not up and out, you're going to fail and I'm going to fail. He says it is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Oh, that's what we want. You know what? The Incredible Hulk never reaped a harvest of righteousness. What I've seen is he's reaped a harvest of dead people, <laughs> of hurt people. Thanks to his actions. Husbands and wives, so important. Respond not in anger. Kids to your parents, parents to your kids, respond not in anger. Christians, if your boss or your coworker offends you, respond not in anger. Instead, respond in integ with integrity copying, imitating your Savior in heaven. And church, right here in the body of Christ, what's up when we hold a grudge? You know, where's the glory in holding a grudge against somebody else in the body of Christ? No, what we're supposed to do is resolve our issues. We're, uh, Jesus says you are to be proactive 
in resolving your issue. We don't get to wait. We don't get to wait for them to, quote, humble themselves and come to us. What we're called to do is humble ourselves and go to them. Hey, brother, listen, can we just talk? Hey, sister, look, uh, there's something that we just need to, you know, take before the Lord. Because what I want to see is him glorified and our relationship restored. If you're holding a grudge, dearly beloved in Christ, remember this, you are choosing to sin. And it's not what edifies a church. It causes hulks in the church. James 1, verses 19 and 20. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Hmm. Love is not irritable, Paul said. I make one more comment now that has to do with the church of the 21st century. And that is this. We cannot express, because it's just as much a sin, we cannot express anger through nasty texts, through tweets, through Facebook posts. Just because your lips don't speak it, your heart is there. It's just as offensive to the Lord as speaking it is. So just like we, you know, zip our lips and pray if we are going to respond in anger, you know what? Turn your computer off and get away from your smartphone if that's how you're going to respond. Any anger is a lack of love. Any anger is dishonorable to Christ. Talk about opportunity. Your post on Facebook, can you imagine this? When it, I, I love reading yours. I love reading others when, it, when it's something like this. Oh, this morning in my devotions, God blessed me through Philippians 4.13. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is just the coolest, most edifying thing, huh? But to go the other direction is flat out wrong. It is, it is flat out sin. I, I um, saw a Facebook post of, of a Christian I really respect. I really respect this person. Been a Christian for many, many years. But on this post was a link to a website that compared President Obama to Adolf Hitler. There was another post very similar that called our president, and our Congress, fools. Over and over again, what I see and what breaks my heart is Christians becoming so political when they're safely tucked behind a screen. No, what the Bible says is God put our leaders where they are. And number two, we pray for our leaders where they are. This whole idea of Christians going after the president because they don't believe in some policy or the Congress because they can't, quote, seem to get anything right is utter sin. Make sure you're not tweeting this kind of junk. Make sure your Facebook posts don't, don't um, draw others into this kind of junk. You want to say something political, it should be like this. I am praying for the leadership of our country. Period. Because it says here, love is not irritable. Love is not angry. Love controls the tongue. Love imitates Christ Jesus. When we do that, oh, what a witness we are. Believers, we have so many responsibilities because so many people are watching us. Let's take it and use it for the glory of God. Let's go on. Love then is not angry. What else? Love is not resentful. Verse 5, love is not resentful. He uses a bookkeeping term there. Logizomahi in the Greek. And what that refers to basically is a journal, like an accounting journal, where they would enter, they would put some entry, some number, and they would put it there 
for the purpose of coming back to it later to like, you know, for calculations, to use it for something else. So he uses that term and he connects it with kakos, <laughs> which is an offense done to you. So you, you already see the visual he's doing here. Let's just say you have a journal for everybody you know. And some guy offends you. Here's what Paul is saying. You would take your journal that's, you know, between you and that guy, and you would write down, he didn't say thank you to me. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm, it's elementary, but whatever the offense, quote the offense is. And the reason it's entered there is because you refuse to see it in the grace of Christ. What he's saying there is you will hold this person accountable, period. Like, that's it. They're just going to be accountable. And I'll tell you how you know these people. They're the ones who will say something like, well, I remember when you said to me, I'm not going to go near that, that woman because you should have heard what she said 14 years ago to me. I can't stand her because of the way she looks at me. These are real things that I've heard. Believer, the same thing. Remember, the, I, I brought up responsibility. We have so many responsibilities, and one of those is to take a lighter and light that journal, let it burn, let it go away. If you're keeping mental lists, same thing. This is probably the biggest up and out ministry. It is so hard to forget past offenses. It is so difficult because of our human nature and us wanting to be protect, protective of ourselves to look at somebody who has offended us, hurt us, said things that, oh, break our hearts, and to just forget. But according to the Bible, this is what our call is. That's why it has to be up and out. You know, um, God will honor your prayer. I'm telling you, he will honor your prayer when you look at the person who you are holding a grudge against. He will honor your prayer when you say to the Lord, God, I know I am in sin because of the lack of love that I have for that person. Because you love him without limit. Just like you love me without limit. Please, instill that love in my heart. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit, he honors that prayer. Suddenly you have the opportunity and the ability, you take it, you go. And there is this interaction, there's this interchange. There's something that just happens that you have to say is a God thing. A God thing happens and suddenly a relationship is restored. Ch churches without hulks, have lots of restored relationships in them. Chances are lots of people have done lots of things to offend you. Here's the question, how are you responding? I'm not going to ask you to look around in the sanctuary, okay? But let's just say you did look around in the sanctuary. Would your eyes fall upon that person that you still got a journal about? Okay, if it does, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Otherwise, you are choosing to sin. The church will not be edified when we do such a thing as that. Ephesians 4, I read this last week. It's so appropriate for today. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Do not talk to other people about your issues with other people. This is a sin that breaks churches down. Gossip. Instead, be kind to each other. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Logizoma, he is the word. It is used of God. You know that? Except 
except in the original language, the word no or not is applied to it. In Proverbs chapter 32, verses 1 and 2, Oh, what a joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. And here it comes. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt. What that translates roughly into is whose journal God has burned. And here's the application. If God does it to you and me, we better do it to one another. Look at number four in your notes, please. So to resent is to remember a wrongdoer's offense, right? The journal entry. However, God never resents his people. People, no resent, or else you're telling God, you know, God, I don't think I want to be like you today. Eh, that's not something I want to tell God, nor do you. Moving on, please. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Proverbs 24, 17, do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Here I'm going to read another commentator on this particular section. He says, love is never glad to hear bad news about another person. Love never says, well, they finally got what they deserve. Love is never happy to hear that a brother or sister fell into sin. Love does not enjoy passing along bad news. And then he says, this certainly goes against modern life. We all know that bad news sells. How true is that? That's why good news goes on page 75. <laughs> That's why they put those supermarket tabloids right by the checkout counter. Because what we want to hear is the juicy gossip about our favorite celebrities. He goes on to repeat himself. True love isn't like that. It turns away from cheap gossip and unsubstantiated rumors. And even when the rumor turns out to be true, love takes no pleasure in the misfortunes of others. Ah, how clear. And probably convicting to all of us to some degree. The fact is, I think a few too many people say, well, he got his. You know, or what comes around goes around. Those are all delighting in another person's wrongdoing, you know that? And here I want to say something very impacting, a perspective that I don't think enough of us have when it comes to this love. When we take pleasure in the downfall of another, we are celebrating sin. You don't think about it like that. Thank you that sin was committed so that this person fell. That's what rejoicing in the wrongdoing of another fundamentally is. Yes, sin. Woo! I love the power of sin. <laughs> Ugh. Whoa. You don't want to say that. Never. Because that's the very sin that Jesus died for. How dare you or I celebrate the sin? See, guys, to rejoice in the wrongdoing, oh, that's an offense to Jesus himself. So please use kind words. You know, somebody falls, um, send them a text. Hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. Send them a note. Give them a call. I know you're hurting. I know there's pain. I'm here for you. That is love. That is church. That is what the church is to be made of. Please, let's not ever celebrate sin, okay? <clears throat> Sympathy, let it reign in your heart. Love, please strengthen my compassion for this person. Anyway, then, finally, love rejoices in the truth. So it's kind of the flip side of what he just said. If you want to 
think about it this way as well. Love doesn't celebrate wrongdoing. It rejoices in the truth. Now, if it has to do with the behavior of a person, a person who commits sin, that's their wrongdoing. Don't celebrate it. But here, rejoice in the truth. That means we celebrate the opposite. Hey, do you see a brother or a sister do a godly thing? Give them a high five. You see somebody say, you know what? I'm, I want to do what Jesus does here. Yes. You know, celebrate. Be a cheerleader to each other when we put ourselves out for the Lord and his truth. Check out number six. Rejoicing in the truth means being glad about behavior that is in agreement with the truth of God. We got to be biblically based, right? We got to live out the words of the Bible. That's what I teach you every Sunday and Wednesday. Let's, let's hold each other up when we do it. Let's support each other when we're trying to do it. That is so cool to see Christians do that. You know, in life groups, that's probably the place where that happens so much, where you get to know each other and you talk about issues and things and you find out about how one person was so offended by their boss, but instead of lashing out, they reached out and the other 10 people say, you know, way to go. Love rejoices with the truth. So I'm going to make um, closing, I'm going to close on that theme of truth but I want it to apply just to the church for the moment, okay? Listen. Um, the celebration or the rejoicing has to do with genuineness in addition to the practice. The church is to be made up of genuine people. Guys, what that means is guards down. You know, masks off. Hearts humble. Here's a gripping way. Look, listen to C.S. Lewis. Erotic love will have naked bodies. Friendship, naked personalities. We're supposed to expose our personalities. We're, we're, we got to be careful. Don't just portray yourself as happy-go-lucky. You know, you got everything in control when behind the scenes you're on the verge of a broken marriage. You're on the verge of a collapse of the family. Something's going on in your life where it's just causing hurt and utter anguish. I want to know, and we want to know. I want you to know about me. I don't want to put up some, you know, some false image or impression to you. I want to be pure, true. What you see, you know, is what you get. And that's, that's the genuineness that a church thrives in. It's why a church rejoices in the truth. Because not only are we celebrating those efforts to live out Christ's word in the world or here in the church, but we know from the inside out, truth is what matters. It's, it's from the inside and out. If I can demonstrate genuineness, I can live genuineness. But if I've got a mask, oh man, are you going to doubt stuff that I do on the outside? Maybe. John said to the church, First, uh, third John 1, for I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. How important is that if the Holy Spirit gave John those words? Truth matters. You keep that, you're keeping the Hulk out. You come up with some kind of lie or some kind of facade. And I don't know what's going to thrive, but it ain't going to be love. So believers, 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, it's all about action. It's about purity. Making the effort for others to see 
Christ honorably and living truth. These are the acts. These are what edify a church. These are what edify the people of God. Let's pray.